Good afternoon and welcome to another edition of the Canalyst Conversation. I am your host, Patrick Doherty, and with us today, we have Gavin Kogan. Gavin, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me. Gavin, where are you? I'm in Carmel Valley, California. Okay. So we got um, a gentleman here from California, and, you know, are you the only person in California who's happy about cannabis? I, I'm not happy about cannabis. Okay, so, so not even you, Someone right? So, <laughs> there's nobody in California that's happy about cannabis these days. Um, well, so I mean, it depends, right? It depends sure. on, on, I mean, ours is a very fractured culture. So there's lots of different, if you're in the cannabis industry and your goal is sort of making money in this industry, you're very unhappy. Right. Um, if you're in the illegal market, you're not getting the best prices, but you're not as disappointed, right? Because it's a shit show and everybody's confirming that you were smart not to join uh, and put your neck out there and pay taxes and do those dumb things that uh, the rest of us did. Yeah, I mean, what's really funny is we we talk to folks in some of the newer emerging markets, and, and since it's all new to them, they're still happy and excited. And yeah. then we talk to anybody in California, and they're like, eh. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, it's a challenge. So what what are you working on these days? What, what's your focus? Yeah, um, my I, I stepped down from uh, a CEO position at Grupo Floor in December last year. Um, I wrapped that up in December and I'm still chairman of the board, um, but it's not, you know, it's not full-time engagement. So what I've been focusing on is really um, three things. Um, one is helping brands go to different states and, and find partners in other states and helping establish those. The other is consulting. Um, and that is companies in startup to uh, expansion strategies to straight up California side restructure and addressing creditor conflicts. Um, and then the third thing is, is sort of doing my, uh, some I'm still doing a little bit of legal counsel and I even have some expert witness in there. I guess I'll throw that all under one, one hat of the legal stuff. And I'm doing some expert witness for various um, conflicts uh, all in California right now. So by way of background, um, you're a serial entrepreneur, you're a recovering attorney, um, and you bring all these skill sets and this experience to the table when working with your clients, I take it. That, that's right. I mean, really, uh, you know, um, not only do I have 20 plus years and also experience being, a, a, you know, uh, as, a, as a cannabis, excuse me, 20 plus years as a lawyer, but also as a business lawyer, but also then, you know, as a cannabis lawyer on top <clears> of that. But then on top of, you know, since leaving the law in approximately 2014, um, you know, it's been cannabis executive since. Of course, I use I use the law all the time, and I've been general counsel. But um, even as CEO, I use my legal training quite a bit, and uh, particularly as in, in there's so many thorny issues that pop up. So that's what I deliver to clients is a pretty hard hitting pistol of being able to have the legal background as well as the business acumen, and having stubbed my toes on multiple startups in this industry. And and we've seen a lot of sort of um, let, let's per se let's say that you know positive news from some recent, you know, political moves. Mm -hmm. Biden obviously has, you know, done the pardons. Gavin has, you know, come up with legislation around cannabis um, where you can't test for folks when up for their off-duty type of usage mm -hmm. and stuff like that. So are, are these beneficial to the industry or are these just election year, you know, semantics? Both. Okay. How about you yeah, elaborate? <laughs> they, they, they are, they are political, you know, there, there's, there's polit politics behind it. But um, I think that, you know, my experience with cannabis is that uh, despite, you know, everybody's hopes, it's been incremental change. And each one of these is incremental change. Even Biden's announcement, while it has minimal real life impact, unless you're one of the 6,000 that actually did impact, um, it does signal to all of the attorneys generals and governors across the United States that, you know, the federal government is behind you. If you want to start a pardon and expungement program, I think that's, that's really important. I think in the cannabis industry side, we don't think so much about those issues, but there's still a tremendous amount of um, injustice out there. And I, I really like that he took that position. I think he also did something probably most important, uh, more important. And that is he plucked the social justice argument um, that has been stuck in the craw of the Senate trying to deal with 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 the back and forth with SAFE. Um, and sort of taking the, a large chunk of that social justice issue off the table um, so that the Senate can pass uh, some, you know, cannabis um, uh, banking 
and um, uplifting, uplift, uplifting um, legislation that I think would really help a lot. You know, at least certainly in California, we're starving for capital. It's just dead. Um, and so any kind of signal like that, positive pivot at the federal level, it's going to have major implications for um, the, the starving markets and certainly for those that are um, still a bit on fire, like on the East Coast, where New Jersey and those areas are, are going to get a lot of that loft as well. You know, and the old adage is be careful what you ask for. So, you know, if federalization happens, there's a lot of people who are generally concerned that, you know, big business will then jump in and take over, right? Yeah. Because we, we've seen moves by the tobacco industry. Obviously, the alcohol industry is trying to figure out how they can get involved. Um, Farmer has an interest. Um, so, you know, what do you think if we, you know, if federalization happens and it becomes legal uh, across, you know, the U.S., is this a good thing or a bad thing? Yeah, that's a, um, that to my answer is it's a timing question. Um, in macro, I think it's a good thing. Um, in terms of the, you know, where the industry is right now, um, I think it'll be incremental. I don't think that we're going to have like legalization next year, Mike. I think that's probably pretty unrealistic, right? Yeah. Um, further, one thing I know about government is when they make a decision like legalization, it takes several years of rulemaking afterwards. Like the DOT has got to have regulations. FDA has got to have regulations. Every, F every department is going to have to have regulations. So that's going to take probably not less than two years to develop after the time that they say we're going to legalize. So I think we're probably not anywhere near 2025 before we're actually having legalization as most people are hearing it, which is cross-border transactions. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of descheduling, I think probably one of the most seismic advantages we get, whether that's done through safe or otherwise, is getting rid of 280E. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's a huge disadvantage to most cannabis businesses. Being able to just to even organically grow is, is, is gravely retarded with 280E in place. So that's a major mover, both for equity and non-equity players in this industry. Um, and uh, to answer your question, um, you know, I think cross-border transactions and sort of the broad scale legalization, um, that is going to definitely happen in my view, that's gonna happen. Um, my hope is that by 2025, 2026, when I, I hope that that, you know, I, I expect to see that come around, that a lot of the businesses are more mature. There's a lot more employees. There's a lot more money in the industry. Um, I don't worry too much about it from like crushing small operators because I think there is um, the, there's a lot of opportunity, even greater opportunity for smaller farms if there's a more robust marketplace. Um, even greater opportunity for smaller brands. I mean, if you think about public companies, they're not the ones that are creating the really bitching products that we're all excited about in consumer packaged goods or furniture. Like that's not who's doing that. They're small companies. And then as they get successful, they get picked up by the bigger companies. But what excites me about this industry is its entrepreneurial spirit and um, drive. And I don't think that that legalization snuffs that. I think legalization actually sparks that. Um, and there's actually an opportunity for something uh, for a lot of these smaller operators to aspire to on a much you know, global national scale um, that, that's reasonable. Right now, I don't know that that's terribly reasonable. It's, there's a few outliers that can do that that have done that well, but very few. There's just not enough capital for that. Yeah, what's interesting is we saw an announcement today coming out of Germany and where they're they're going through the same process where they're trying to figure out, you know, they've announced it, they say they're going to do it, and now they're trying to figure out how to make it work. And one of the things that they've said is we're only going to allow um, product grown in Germany. And we've seen that here in the States where the, the states have taken a, a protectionist view, yeah. right? And, you know, but when we see federalization and we see cross-state, you know, do you still grow product in Maine or do you, you know, import, you know, California product? Because, you know, it, we obviously, you know, we're California, so we think we grow the best product. But, you know, yeah, yeah. So what happens to the local I mean, market um, that, you know, isn't really a good growing environment per se? Yeah, those are those, those are very serious. There's other considerations such as the cost of labor in Nevada and Oregon is so cheap compared to California, the cost of labor, the cost of real estate, the cost of operations, the tax structures. Like if you don't think that weed from Oregon and Nevada is going to come flooding into the mids market in California, you're dreaming. Like that's just, that's how the flower market died in, the, in my valley here, right? Yeah. It's just 
It's cheaper to do it in Colombia, cheaper to do it in Venezuela. So um, I think there's a bit of that, but um, California has a um, parts of California, particularly Northern California, do they really have, like, we've got a couple of things going for us. One, um, we have been buying weed over the counters for 30 years. We have a very well-developed culture and concept and understanding of who's buying cannabis, when and why, and even that's nascent, but we're starting to really get our arms around it. Um, and, but it's, it's, you know, you go to other States, um, five years ago, you go to jail if you were growing, you know, uh, in, in our, in our, in our, in our state, like people have been doing this for, you know, quasi legal as it were with, the, with the immunity for 30 years. And what that does is it creates an economy of communication. So growers know more and they're, they're actually sharing more, uh, manufacturers are sharing employees are transferring. And so you're getting that kind of cross pollination of knowledge sets like you have in Silicon Valley or Hollywood that make those prime spots for innovation. So I think California is going to carry that in cannabis. Um, I, I, I'm prejudiced. Of course, I think some of the best cannabis, uh, if not the best cannabis is grown in California, but I'll tell you, Oregon grows some bomb weed. I mean, really strong, strong genetics up there and strong growers. Um, they give a run to a lot of grower, a lot of growers in California. So um, having said that, I think people in Minnesota are going to want to have California weed, whether it's better or not, if it's the same quality. The other issue is it, is it indoor? Like if it's indoor weed, is that really going to be different in LA than it's going to be, you know, in Minneapolis it's indoor. So if, if the genetics can be transferred without fear of, you know, you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah. so there's those issues. Um now the now California's passed OCAL, so now there's organic cannabis that has sort of this concepts overriding co concepts of um, resource management around cannabis as well, not just um, terpenes and 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 uh, cannabinoid testing or heavy metals testing. There's a there's a whole other panel of of attributes that consumers want. So I I'm excited about weed still because there's so many different forms and form functions and products to be developed and um, uh, created a new um it's not like the wine industry where there's one way you drink wine right it's like there's there's one way to consume wine there's like probably 15 different ways to consume cannabis off the top of my head um that are each a product segment product area that then have a multiplicity of skews within each one of those so it's it's a massive marketplace i don't worry for um the industry being shut down by some big company like procter and gamble coming in i just it, it's just it's not feasible you know i, I think i'll have a huge dent but I think we've got a, a huge opportunity for the smaller operators in, in legalized in legalized market, which is where I think we're going. Yeah, I mean, we, we've sort of said the same thing. Where like, you know, if you look at the craft beer model, you know, so if you are a consumer and you want organic, if you want, you know, it to be free of GMOs, if you want it to be grown outside, um, if you want it to be locally grown, those seems to be opportunities for yeah. you know local growers and, and smaller operations to supply that. Sure. And they grow, you know, businesses grow. Samuel Adams was a small brewery at one point. 805 was a small brewery. At one. Lagunitas was a small brewery at one point. Sweetwater, you know, was a small brew. Like companies just naturally grow because they're popular. People like that and they trend set. And then there's another group of inventors that come behind them. So I don't see why we would be any different. In fact, I think that it's going to be even more hyper um on that tip so i i look at it with a, a positive view where there'll be some shitty results of course you know uh, it's going to take 20 years for that thing to roll out and be make any sense to anybody um i just worry about there being enough money on the table for operators to actually be able to produce um and, and make a profit and i think getting rid of 280e um if people can have five years post 280e before they legalize I don't see any reason why you couldn't have a really healthy substrate to 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 grow a legal market nationwide upon. Yeah, I mean, you know, one of the discussions that we have with our clients is, you know, if, if you can't hang out for the next five years without making any money, you're probably going to be in trouble, right? You know, we think yeah. if you can hang out, you're going to be well positioned and you'll do quite well on the other side of it. Um, but this problem isn't going away anytime soon. No. And, and, and I would say, particularly for my California, you know, West coast brethren that are going through some trouble, you know, um, that it's, it, the goal should be, I, it, this is just my opinion. A lot of people hate this opinion, but my opinion, this is not a time for growing. This is, if you think about the prop 215 era and before like scaling is a problem, 
right? You, one, you have to grow organically. You have to scale organically. Plus, if you scale, you expose yourself to law enforcement. You, sco- you know, expose yourself to poaching. So scaling had to be done in kind of a creative um, partnership. That's why in the post um, legalized market, lawyers are spending so much time untangling all these goddamn partnerships all over the place from the legacy markets. You know, one person is in 15 different relationships. It's exhausting. Mm-hmm. But that's what you do when the chips are down. You have to be creative. And um, that's what I think that operators need to do right now. I think they need to go back to a Prop 215 mindset and get really creative. Now, obviously, there's some people who have access to capital. Go for the capital. That's fine. But the vast majority do not. And if you can get to $1 you know, positive um, and, and you, you can stay there and you believe in the dream, then I, I think it's, it's yeah, the long term. Right? You got you to be in yeah. for a long term play. And I'm not saying people can't grab market share. You know, you sure can. And hopefully there'll be more dispensaries and more delivery and things like that. Um, There's a lot of opportunities. It's just, it's really hard to do it with 280E burden and have no capital. Um, It's hard enough running a business, let alone growing that business in that environment. Yeah, I mean, what's interesting, like in in San Francisco, you you couldn't put more dispensaries here. I mean, they're everywhere. You know, there is, um, near my house, there is, maybe a four block radius. And I think there's five dispensaries on that one street mm-hmm. within four blocks. Like, you yeah. know, it's pretty saturated. Yeah. I mean, yeah. and, but, but it's incredibly telling those four or five dispensaries are credible, you know, telling about the industry because one is a big brand. And when you go in there, the bud tellers can't be bought. The vendors can barely be bothered with you. You know what yeah. I mean? Like you're interrupting their day. Um, you know, th- there's another one that, you know, they're very nice, very, very friendly, but, um, you know, they will, they take credit cards, but then they charge it like a 30% fee on top of that. So by the mm-hmm. time the pricing gets ridiculous, and then there's one that they're nice enough guys, it's a cash business, um, you know, and, and the price is, is realistic. Um, yeah. I did laugh though the other day, I went in and, and there's a product called the dime bag that costs 25 bucks. Yeah, no, I know, I know dime bag. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, that's, that's, um, you know, what's also kind of interesting about that, Mike, is that all these dispensaries right now are trying to do the same thing. And what I mean by that is Mas o Menos, mm-hmm. they're selling as many products as they can uh, and trying to make a profit. And nobody has enough capital to take a risk right now and properly differentiate. Like, I don't see anybody doing an all flower shop. Mm-hmm. Flowers, 54%. If you could be a target destination, why wouldn't you do something like that, right? Because it's risky. Well, but people are going to want edibles. They're going to go to other shops. Um, That kind of thinking starts to come in when you do have a more saturated marketplace. But right now, all dispensaries are kind of trying to do the same thing. There's only, you know, shit, when I started, um, there was almost 3,000 dispensaries, I think we counted, you know, stores, right? And I'm not even delivery. And like, we don't even have 900, in, in, in this environment currently. So it's not surprising that all the shops are trying to be a shop for to all people because they can play that game. But as that retail market starts to become a little bit more congested, people are going to start doing, you know, stuff like Planet 13, like trying to do some crazy, like, you know, come by and get your donuts and your weed or, you know, get your palm red in the back or, you know, car free car wash with an eighth of weed. Like there's going to be those kinds of things as people start to get a little bit more differentiated. But right now, Retail owns the landscape in California, um, but I, I don't think we're very far off where brands start to beat up dispensaries and start to, you know, corral and control the marketplace as they do in traditional retail. Uh, right now, Coca-Cola uh, tells people, tells retail where they're going to be on the shelves. You know, Procter & Gamble tells Safeway where they're going to be on the shelves. Um, so those are just power shifts. And it's a lot like the fuel industry. Early on, gasoline stations had a lot of power. And then as there started to be a lot more gasoline stations, they don't have the power. It's the infrastructure that has the power. That's even evolved a little bit to the refinery, right? So um, the, there's going to be power shifts. I think you're going to see that in California for sure, where it's going to be brand powerful in four or five years and dispensaries are not going to have the kind of power to beat up and not pay people like they do now. Yeah, I mean, one of the interesting things around brands is that, I mean, I think we're at the very early stages of brand awareness and brand development. Um, because I, I, you know, people don't go in and ask for a brand. They go in and ask for an experience. You know, I want something that will make me sleep. I want something that will make me, you know, deal with anxiety. 
Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I, you know, not you know, the the experienced person knows a couple of brands, but I think the average person off the street is is going in and asking for an experience, and that's why they're talking to butt tenders. Is that you know, like, what do you recommend? Yeah, yeah. I often I often tell my clients, um, if you're not thinking that the butt tender is the consumer, you're thinking about this wrong. Right now, the butt tender is the consumer. That's who you need to be selling to. And if you're you're trying to sell to people on Instagram and you think that just handing out lanyards to the bud tenders is, is doing a good job, you're sorely mistaken. Having run, you know, having five dispensaries right now, everybody gives us lanyards, Schnorsville. Like do something creative, uh, do something new. But those are the people that are, are being asked those questions that you just raised. I want to feel this way. Um, you know, there's just there's no differentiate like in flower, nobody's asking for brand. I mean, not nobody. Rarely right. Yeah. Hardcore cards. people will, but no, but the yeah, average but guy I mean, off the street, no. But even flower buyers, like I, they're not, you're not smoking the same. Maybe you're trying a different strain from a different farm. Cause you're just like, man, I'm just crazy about J13. You know, I don't mm -hmm. know, but you know, uh, but with, with how loose we are with the parlance of what strains are called now. And you're like, and as a flower smoker myself, I'm always trying to try different things. But if we're talking about differentiated goods like terabytes from Kiva or, you know, a chocolate bar from La Familia or, or beverages from Uncle Arnie's, you know, that's a big investment. That's like a four or five hour trip that you're investing in. So you get a lot of brand loyalty with differentiated goods, but you don't get that with flowers. So we have to also think about the different parts of the shop as having different kind of marketing strategies around that product. I was actually talking to David about that very subject recently. And, and when when you work with clients, you know, where are you sort of focused? What are you trying to help them do? Is it brand awareness? Is yeah. it? Um, you know, it depends on the client, right? They come in different sure. shapes and sizes or different needs, I should say. Well, I guess shapes and sizes too. But um, for the for this subject, um, people that are expanding either within a jurisdiction like California, trying to get from Northern California to Southern California, which if you don't know, are very different consumer cultures very different consumer cultures in Oakland than San Francisco. Yeah. Right. So um, I'll, I will talk to them about those issues. Uh, I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that we still see people coming in trying to sell to, to demographics that are getting a lot of attention, but people are not buying a lot of. Um, and so I, I, you know, for example, the, there, there's always brands that are like, you know, we're, we're doing diamonds infused pre-rolls and our target market is soccer moms. I'm like, uh, that's, cool and your yeah. package design is great but guess what newsflash soccer moms aren't smoking infused rerolls right. in mass right they're more of a vape crowd right now so um so I mean, one of the interesting things we've seen here is you know we've some, seen somebody who i won't name so you have to figure it out if you can um who has decided that they're going to go after the women's space and address mm -hmm. you know women's issues however they have no when you, when you read their information and you you look at their products, clearly this is someone who only sees that as a you know a market niche market that they, segment. Yeah. yeah, and you know not providing any education, not providing any products that are you know generally need. Um, yeah, for, yeah. You know something that um, I'm a really big fan of Simon Sinek. I've learned a lot from him, and and I don't know if you know him, but he he does um, podcasts and and um, some YouTube things and. Uh, he's all over the place. He's pretty wise. And one of the things that I really glommed onto early on that moved me greatly, and I, I, share, I share this with clients a lot, so I'll share it here, is that people don't buy what you do or how you do it. They buy why you do it, mm -hmm. right? It's, 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 the, it's the why that people do. And one of the things that Simon used that I thought was so funny is, you know, Martin Luther King, right? He, he, he said, I have a dream. He didn't say I have a plan. I said, I have a dream and that's what people call it. So like the spirit. So to your point, you've got this consumer, excuse me, this consumer good that's marketing to a segment. Consumers are smart. Bud tenders are smart. They know who's full of shit and who's not. And if you're aligned with your philosophy, it's all over the packaging. It's all over the vibe. People get that. Um, if you're not paying attention um, out there, just look at social media. What gets the biggest raise is the stuff that's off the cuff and is not highly produced and that is rough where somebody drops the phone in the middle of the, the right. um, that's what gets, that's what gets ratings because it's honest. So if you come at this with some polished bullshit, you're in the wrong market. And also you're just not, you just don't have your best wig on when it comes to marketing weed. So when you look forward, what excites you most about the cannabis industry? Um, 
I'm pretty beat up right now. I got to tell you. In terms You're in of California. Just, we get that. Yeah. For his, <laughs> right. You know, I actually, I wrote this poem the other night, you know, I don't do that by the way, but I just kind of got, had this, you know, just this, something that I love about cannabis is the, um, call it unreasonable hope of the operators. It's like this unreasonable hope. There's almost like this joyous, inventive, youthful energy. And that's one of the things that really attracted me to cannabis, almost like this mission that we can change the world. I still very much believe that. And that for me is what's most exciting is to see cannabis change the culture from sort of this dark, alcoholic, um, you know, socially tense environment. And one of the things that I, per, like my own kind of shtick about cannabis is that I, I believe that it makes for a kinder culture, a culture that, you know, allows for cannabis consumption. Um, cannabis itself sort of is very evocative of I I introspection, you know, whereas alcohol does the opposite, right? So I, I drink alcohol, by the way, I'm not lambasting alcohol, but from a cultural perspective, I think that American culture could do with a little bit more introspection. So I like that about cannabis spiritually. So that's the stuff that I, I'm excited about. Um, I think w actually being participant and live at this time when the death of the drug war is really finally over and people are out of jail and people can express themselves without fear of, of going to jail for it. Um, we're darn near the end of that. Um, as that finally comes to an end, I believe it will come to an end. Um, then I think that starts to go global. Um, but I'd have to say, um, having kind of accomplished the goal of legalization, you know, at least in spirit, what excites me is the creativity around this and watching this industry actually blossom into something that we don't quite know what it's going to be and the challenges ahead. Some of the fears you raised about, you know, pharmaceuticals, how are they going to come in and um, the the GM, big, you know, CGMP manufacturers, um, you know, how, how are they going to come in? I think there's going to be a lot of that. And I think consumers are also going to want small farm stuff, batch stuff. I think that's just very legit. And, and maybe not all from California, like, you know, not all wine is from Napa. Right. So um, Oregon, Washington has some, in my house, we started drinking a lot of Oregon wines. I, I never would have thought of doing that, you know, 10 years ago or so it wouldn't have been on my radar screen. Or if I taste it, that's really light. I don't care for it. But as I've evolved, um, you know, uh, in my taste as I've gotten older, I kind of like that lighter taste, just like as, it, as a man, um, when I was younger, I liked sativas as I'm an older guy, I kind of prefer indicas to be honest. So I think you just sort of your taste change things that you like change. And, uh, I'm excited to see it mature into an industry where people have uh, a lot of job opportunities and a lot of creativity. That's not, for me, it's the creative excitement that, that jazzes me the most. Sorry for that long answer, but I think that's good. No, 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 no. I mean, one of the things that, that I think is exciting is we're also seeing a shift from, I mean, there's still a core element that wants the highest THC possible and, and that element sure. will never go away. Yeah. But yeah. there is, what we're seeing is this could be a wellness product, right? This can be, you know, used and benefit. You know, we're seeing it from the medicinal side that it has benefits. We're seeing it from the recreational side that, you know, while it may not be a medical study, we know people are more relaxed, the introspectives that you talked about, you know, we're, we're connecting this product with wellness. And, you know, that's way beyond the, I'm in high school and I just want to get high, you know, by yeah. the back of the school, right? So it's a different, totally. you know, consumer at this point in time. And, and, and I think that's going to change and, and it's going to become more complicated who these consumers are for different. For example, the market around sleeping edibles that are specifically for sleeping, that's a no-brainer. That's going to be a murder market, right? That's going to be huge worldwide. Right, and, and pain um, relief for you know arthritis and other yeah. elderly type issues and things like that. I think the topicals. You know, if I was just getting into the industry right now and I was like, okay, I want to, I have enough money to kind of build a company and get, a, I, I'd go deep in topicals. It's just not well, it's not well um, targeted. There's not a lot of players in it. It's a soft area. Yeah, it's a small market, but so is beverages. Um, I think, you know, whoever can get the top of that, like Papa and Barclays did a pretty good job getting to the top. Uh, it's my impression they've shifted a little bit, but I don't, you know, I don't, I don't know. Um, but um, like, that's a huge market. There's a lot of people who, um, in five years are going to be using cannabis regularly and are not using it now. And I'm not talking about, you know, 
young 20 year old men smoking weed and playing video games. I mean, like for a lot of sophisticated, you know, more sophisticated, sophisticated reason than just getting high and getting high is fine too. And, and, and yeah. can be sophisticated, but we have I'm nothing wrong with that. Just yeah. There's going to be a lot of different reasons that people are, are engaging in, 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 in this plant. So I think that's a, a super, um, uh, it's, it's just kind of wild to watch it unfold. Like today, I don't know if you noticed, but um, Circle K announced a deal with Green Thumb Industry. And Circle K is owned by uh, Couchetard in, in Canada. And uh, Circle K gas stations are all over. And what they're doing is they're co-partnering and they're doing small little express stop dispensaries in um, next to Circle Ks. So now buying your cannabis is going to be right at Circle Ks. It's pretty amazing move. Yeah, and if you don't feel like going to Circle K, industry. apparently Uber will bring it to you as well, right? Because they did a deal up in Canada with Uber Eats. It makes sense. Yeah, yeah. So uh, to me, that stuff is just bonkers. It's kind of interesting to be in the industry and watch it grow. And if you're in this industry and if you're listening to this podcast, you probably are because uh, of the subject matter. Um, everybody on this, you know, who's who's here knows that when you go into a cocktail party or a dinner and you're the only one there that's in the weed industry, what's that conversation about? you in yeah. this industry it's fascinating to everybody it's not just you're the only one who admits you're in the industry yeah they just they're just That's fascinated. Difference, right yeah they're just other they're, folks are in the industry fascinated. they're just not talking about it yeah they're and i mean even if they're against it and i've had plenty of conversations very very great conversations people are like i i'm just against it and you know having run at that windmill for you know many years it's mm -hmm. it's an easy conversation without to, without getting heated um but it it's um it's always just fascinating to people and it's it i think it just will continue to be fascinating for me fascinating for me i, I look forward to writing about it and being maybe a little bit more of a board member um maybe some education i was invited to speak at, at, at a university so that's kind of kind of fun to do some stuff like that and i think as it evolves they'll start to be course curriculums around that and Somebody who's been in the industry as long as you have and I have, is, I, I think there's lots of neat opportunities to talk about our experience in bringing this industry from past to present. And, and do you think you'll get the uh, entrepreneurial bug again? You know, um, it's funny you should ask that. Um, I, yeah, that 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 never goes away. But mm -hmm. hard, startups are hard; they're extremely mm -hmm. difficult. And as I get older, I have less and less tolerance for the bullshit of startups. They're just they take a certain degree of energy that at, at this age, you know, with teenagers and and um, I I don't, you know, if I did, it'd be part of a larger team, mm -hmm. um, and it'd be very specific and not just sort of like the crazy you know, what we had in 2018, where it's like, okay, it's all legal. And it's like, uh, we're going to own the entire supply chain. Like I'm never going to launch a whole supply chain again. If I do mm -hmm. another entrepreneurial gig, it will be a targeted product probably, um, or it'll be in a sector like organic, um, uh, you know, so something along that, those lines. Um, that's kind of where I see myself probably working. Having said that, um, I've, I've also, you know, done some interviews for um, some C-suite type positions in different companies um, that are different states and international. That could be a lot of fun. So, you know, I don't know. I'm kind of like everybody else here, just trying to be scrappy and figure out what the next move is. Um, and in the meantime, I find that the consulting is really gratifying because I get to share my experience and um, um, expertise, as it were, um, with people that are that are that are coming up and trying to forge new new paths. And that that's pretty fun, actually. So if folks are interested in working with you, how do they find you? My website, gavincogan.com, G-A-V-I-N-K-O-G-A-N.com. Um, I'm also all over LinkedIn. I try to drop a lot of content on LinkedIn. Um, uh, or you can also just email me at gavin, um, at, at gavincogan at gmail.com. Gavin, we appreciate your time. We appreciate your insights. Um, we'll check back with you in five years and we'll see how we did. <laughs> awesome. I, I Actually, hopefully we'll check back before then, but we, again, we appreciate your yeah. time. Thank you for joining us and we look forward to uh, future conversations. Right on. Thanks, Mike.